past four in the morning and I'm running a little bit late. The monks here at the Amaravati Monastery have already begun their morning meditation. I'm here at the start of an exploration of the art and architecture of Buddhism and also hope to learn more about its key teachings. I'll be visiting monasteries and temples in India, Japan and China. But where better to start discovering Buddhism than Berkhamsted? After leafy Hertfordshire, my journey will take me to places where the Buddha has been worshipped across two millennia. I'll start my journey in India with some of the oldest sites associated with Buddhism, visiting the great stupa at Sanchi and the glorious cave temples at Ellora. Then, following the spread of Buddhism across East Asia, I'll travel to China and see the astonishing long men carvings and, from a thousand or so years later, the big Buddha hall at Chengdu. After that, it's off to Cambodia, to the Bayon Temple at the heart of the ancient city of Angkor Thom, and to a 12th century Buddhist monastery that was later reclaimed by the jungle. And I'll finish my travels in Japan, in traditional temples there, and in an unconventional and ultra-modern Buddhist temple built at the end of the 20th century. All of these extraordinary places are associated with a sacred tradition that has some 300 million followers around the world. And all of them are beautiful and often moving expressions of the art of faith. To prepare for my travels to the sacred sites of Buddhism, I've come to the Amaravati Monastery near Berkhamsted to meet the venerable Ajahn Sumedho. Now in his 70s, he has a master's degree from Berkeley and was attracted to Buddhism soon after college whilst working for the US Peace Corps in the 1960s in Southeast Asia. He set up the Amaravati Monastery as a center of Buddhist learning in the more ancient of its main branches, the Theravada tradition. It's about meditation, silence and stillness. The site here was once a school and before that an army base, but in the 1980s it was transformed into a Buddhist monastery. The meditation hall was completed in 1999. What were you aiming to build here? Is, it, was, is there a standard Buddhist temple that you could say this, this is what it has to be? Well, we agreed with the council that the people didn't want a kind of exotic uh, Asian building. Right. And the idea then was uh, to build something more kind of that would blend into the English countryside. So the, the spa is, is your one bit of exoticism here? Yeah, well, I thought it needed, uh, you know, it, it needed something to give it uh, a kind of a loyalty to the tradition I'm from. May we have a look inside? Yes. Thank you. The, the temple has a, a, a very, very calm, almost insulated atmosphere. Was that, was that, did you aim for that when you were designing it with the architect? Well, when, when the architect came and he asked me what I had in mind, I was, I was just being facetious, really, joking about it. I said, well, I want you to build a temple that's so peaceful and quiet, as soon as stressed out Londoners enter it, they feel calm. And of course, I thought that was ridiculous to ask anybody to design anything that would accommodate that. But actually, that's what he's done. Yeah. And it surprised me, because this place is, is one of the most still, quiet, places I've ever been in. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's worked for this stressed out life. <laughs> <Yes. so. laughs> We're all very busy people with lots of uh, ideas and desires. What is Buddha's teaching about in, in terms of the essence of, of, of taking us away from that, re perhaps relieving us of, the, of that busyness? Meditation is a, is a way of, of addressing the problem in which you, you free yourself. You're letting go uh, this habitual grasping is, is, is no longer your way of experiencing life. So you're not just trapped. This is what stress is, you know, when it's just stressed and caught in patterns of obsessions and 
self-criticism and guilt and remorse and worries and how do you get out of it? Speaking with Ajahn Sumedho in the meditation hall, I was reminded very forcefully of my experiences as a hostage for more than five years in the late 1980s. When I was locked up in the Lebanon, um, the first few months, uh, four months I think it was, I was uh, kept in, in solitary confinement in this tiny little cell deep underground and I had no idea who'd taken me or why. What I didn't have, and I do remember talking about it with, with my fellow hostages, particularly um, Brian Keenan, the Irish guy who I spent four years with, uh, we, we thought, how, how can we use this time? We, we have very little stimuli. We're often in blank rooms underground with very little, very little reading matter and no radios or televisions. So we were stripped of all that sort of busyness that we, that we have in, in, in the ordinary world, in the real world. How can we use that time? And I think it would, having been speaking to you and seeing what goes on here at Amaravati, the, idea, the ability to meditate would have been possibly a great advantage. Yeah, just, you know, I think of, of uh, solitary confinement as a kind of uh, wonderful opportunity. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> and the funny thing is, actually, the funny thing is, I, I'm just thinking about it. A, the, one of the guards once came in, and we were saying we need books or whatever. And he spoke very fluent English. He was a volatile character, a very dangerous character, actually. Um, and he said, well, you must meditate. And of course, unfortunately, we didn't have an Ajahn to teach us <laughs> how to do that, so yeah. we tried. But um, since coming home and since being back and you know, happily, very, 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 very happy to be free again, of course, I've noticed talking to Brian and Terry Waite and others uh, that I was held with, that the, uh, people are surprised that we often feel the need for solitude. And this is what I like about Buddhist teaching. It, it gives you the very tools so you can transcend the thinking process. And, and that, of course, is what mindfulness does. So it's a, it's a very powerful kind of gut knowledge of knowing in a direct way. Ajahn Sumedho said that when he designed this temple, he wanted to create a space of stillness and silence. And uh, this evening's puja, after the chanting, which I found very peaceful, the lights were dimmed and there was uh, the candles set around the figure of Buddha. And I was trying to concentrate and be mindful uh, and not, frankly, not off to sleep. Um, but in the darkness, there was a real sense of stillness and space. And although there were 60 or 70 people here, there was a sense of absolute peace and calm, which I found very beautiful. anywhere further removed from the quiet half of the countryside than this. It's a central station in Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. And yet apparently, a change of trains and an hour's ride, and I'll be somewhere that can rival the Amaravati Monastery in Berkhamsted as a setting for calm contemplation. At least that's what I'm told. Although there are no legends to link Sanchi directly with the travels of the Lord Buddha, this remote location in central India has attracted his followers for more than 2,000 years. Sanchi is one of the most important sites for Buddhist pilgrimage, and at its heart is this stupa. Originally a simple burial mound to contain the ashes and belongings of the Buddha and his followers, stupas, and I should say, they're solid, there's no interior, became the fundamental building block for Buddhist architecture. All the different forms of Buddhism begin with an historical figure from around six centuries before Jesus. According to the Buddhist texts, Prince Siddhartha, the son of a tribal chief, turned his back on the world in a search for the true path. And once he found it, he became enlightened. He is said to have spent nearly 50 years as a wandering monk and was renamed Buddha, quite simply meaning the Enlightened One. When he died, his relics were divided up among his followers, who built commemorative mounds to house them. 
The great stupa at Sanchi was created in this tradition, and the chatra on top, with its three parasols, is a symbol of high rank, honoring and sheltering the relics. The stupa was commissioned originally in the 3rd century BCE by the great emperor Ashoka, who ruled over almost all of present-day India. It's one of many monuments that he built after he embraced the teachings of the Buddha, apparently in reaction to witnessing the slaughter in one of his military campaigns. In its present form, the stupa is larger than in Ashoka's day, and the wonderful gateways with their scenes from the Buddha's life and an abundance of animals and other figures were carved around 70 BCE. Yoichi Yamagata is a Japanese Buddhist who runs a nearby rural health program, but who comes here in his spare time to sketch the details and decorations of the exquisite carvings. He tells me the story that the Lord Buddha's birth was prophesied by his mother's dream in which a white elephant entered her side. The mother of Lord Buddha sleeping and Buddha's spirit came into her body in the form of white elephant. Oh, really? Yeah, and elephant, uh, of course, is the most powerful animal. And the, uh, the white elephant was only used by the kings. Uh, he was supposed to be either the universal ruler or the universal teacher. Watching you do that makes me realize <laughs> yeah. how, how inept yeah. I would be. Yeah. Elephants are very well depicted here and I'm really fascinated because you have uh, so many other animals mm. almost everything is very nicely done but if you compare carefully lions are stylized they have certain style certain pose yes and uh, uh, compared to elephants which can stand sit you know wade into water or, or could be tame or or could be wild yeah. you know so is that why the lion is, it looks more stylized? They look more like some, I don't know, medieval card. card yeah, card. yeah. Stylistically, there were, of course, you know, many, uh, much influence from Greece. Mm -hmm. Not directly from, from the Greece Mediterranean, but, you know, the culture, Hellenistic yeah. culture came uh, up to here. So uh, I, I can imagine a kind of, you know, mixed uh, artisans. Some people came from the West and, and you know, train the local people, but local people had their own concept, so it's yeah. a kind of mixture. The other panels yeah. that we're seeing, you, you yeah. said they, they, they rec were recounting stories? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, some of them uh, recounting stories of Buddha himself or Buddha's former lives in, oh, okay. yeah, through Jataka. Right, okay. Jataka stories. And, the, and, yeah. the, and the, those are the stories that account what, what happened to him in his, in his previous life. Previous life, yeah. yeah. Okay, previous and life. how good he was and how he accumulated his you know, credit of benevolence. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not really uh, organized in a chronological way, so that you have to go around, round, and no, okay. yeah, to understand the, the yeah. totality. Although we're all familiar with figures of the Lord Buddha, in art from this time, his presence is only ever suggested the human body was thought to be too confining for him. And instead, the carvings show only traces of his life on earth, like footprints or a parasol. These are surrounded with scenes of familiar everyday life, all of which were commissioned and paid for by pilgrims and merchants. When devotees come to the stupa, they pay homage to the Lord Buddha by circling the mound on the raised pathway. You only ever do this in a clockwise direction, so that you're always presenting your right side, the purer side, to the stupa and to the buried relics. This stupa is magnificent, and all the carvings are exquisite. The animals and the panels depicting scenes from the Buddha's previous incarnations. But what's really important to remember is that at this period, the Buddha himself was only represented symbolically with footprints and the lotus flower and the wheel, a reference to his first great sermon about the wheel of Dharma. Of course, subsequently, he was represented in human form. And just as Buddhist art moved on, so did the architecture, from the stupa to prayer halls, monasteries and temples, like this one from the seventh century, which has a very Greek look about it. 
This almost classical temple is one of the later religious monuments scattered across the hilltop, including several early Hindu temples. Remember, much of this comes from the time of the Romans in Europe, and there was clearly a lot of activity here right through until the 12th century, when the importance and influence of Buddhism in India, although not, as we'll see elsewhere, began to decline. It's taken me two days to get here, with all the usual travel hassles of planes and trains. So it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to spend the day here at Sanchi. It's one of those rare places which, with a combination of the architecture, sense of history, the landscape, and just something in the air, which creates an atmosphere that encourages you to slow right down, to sit and think. These are Langur monkeys, famous for being fiercely territorial. So much so that apparently the central government in Delhi uses them to keep other monkeys away from ministerial buildings. Here, their role is not official. Nevertheless, they are still guarding one of the world's most extraordinary architectural sites. 30 kilometers from the city of Aurangabad lies a temple complex created some seven centuries after the carvings at Sanchi and one that's a wonderful example of the next fundamental form of Buddhist architecture. These are the caves of Elora. Stretching along a two-kilometer escarpment, there are 34 Buddhist, Hindu and Jain temples. Built between the 5th and 10th centuries, they are all carved from the solid rock. The Buddhist caves in particular are believed to have been constructed between 630 and 700 CE. That's after many of the Hindu temples. This, of course, is long before the great monasteries and cathedrals of Christianity in Europe. The fact that they are nestled alongside the Hindu temples, and indeed temples dedicated to Jainism, suggests that this was a time of religious tolerance in India. Before coming here, I'd always imagined that cave dwelling would be very basic. But look at this. It's an apartment block that they've carved into the hillside. It's cave number 11, a Buddhist vihara or monastery where the monks would have both lived and worshipped. This monastery was one of the last to have been hewn out of the rock. There are three stories, and each floor is adapted to a different level of spiritual attainment. Everywhere you look, there are images of the Lord Buddha. By this stage, there were no inhibitions whatsoever about depicting and worshipping his image in human form. My guide to the Buddhist caves is the architect Ajay Kulkarni. He's keen to show me one of the other caves nearby. Wow. It's an amazing space, isn't it? Yeah, wonderful. So, and this is cave number 10? This is cave number 10, yeah. What, what is it, Ajay? Actually, cave number 10 is known as Vishwakarma. Vishwakarma is the architect of the gods. Ah, okay. So we are in the most divine cave of this entire cave complex of 34 caves. It is awe-inspiring to see these places. Yeah. How, how did they do it? Well, just imagine, for instance, what must have been there before. Yes. Just a hill. You can see this profile of the hill yeah. on the both sides. And you have to imagine, and particularly, like we construct nowadays, you know, from bottom to top yes, we go. Yeah. In this case, we are coming from the top to bottom. This is a rock-cut architecture. And this is a Vishwakarma, is also known as Carpenter. Carpenter? Yes. Okay, wow. So this cave is also known as Sutarka Jopada, and a carpenter's hut. So in particularly in this cave, you will see a lot of little, little carpentry details, you see? Oh, I see, yeah. You see, actually, these are all rocket caves. Yeah. So they don't need any supports. As an architect, Ajay, when you, when you come here, how, how do you feel? I feel, you see, this is a place which gives me the idea of a divine permanence. And from where does this divine permanence come? Somebody must have had a great deal of faith. So this tendency, when I'm offering myself, so there is no me. So me and the God are one. 
So we are together creating this. That's why this divine permanence comes. Beyond the entrance is the Chaitya, or hall, with the seated Buddha in the posture traditionally associated with teaching. Good Lord. It's like, a, wow. <laughs> it's like walking into a cathedral. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's, it's huge. What an amazing space, too. So, this is a typical Chaitya Hall. Chaitya Hall? Chaitya Hall. Yeah. It's a very, very typical Chaitya Hall. And that's, that's a hall especially for worship? For worship of the Buddhist caves only. Right, okay. The moment you step in, on the main axis is the deity. That's the main element of Chaitya Hall. No mistake, you have to focus only on the ultimate. You step in, you see this. And this wall on the top, which is again depicting from the wooden architecture. You can see those ribs, basically. It's very beautiful, no? Absolutely. It always almost makes you forget that you are inside a piece of rock. You're right. You walk in here, yeah. and you keep thinking, what a beautiful building. Yeah. And then you have to pinch yourself and say, yeah. but wait a minute, this is a mountain. I'm it's in a, a mountain. You are in a mountain. Behind the, the figure of Buddha, that shape, is that again the, the, the stupa I've seen at Sanchi? It's a stupa, yeah. 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 That's oh. the stupa where the, the things, those divine things of Lord Buddha are kept. That's the faith. And that stupa is there. And around that stupa, you are making a circumambulation of the whole world. That's a very symbolic. In all this Indian architecture, you'll see a great element of symbolism. I really enjoyed hearing Ajay speak about how these temples inspire his work as a modern architect. And it's intriguing to learn how over a thousand years ago, when these temples were first carved from the mountainside, the design of one would inform the building of the next. This influence extended beyond India, as Buddhism traveled eastwards across Asia to China. Along with the faith went its architecture. Buddhism arrived in China during the first century CE, traveling with merchants and others along the trade routes from India. But it didn't make much of an impact for several hundred years. One of the main centers where it attracted official favor was Luoyang towards the end of the fifth century. And it was there throughout the rest of the first millennium that an astonishing complex of Buddhist cave temples was to be built. Luoyang was chosen as the site of the new imperial capital of the Northern Wei rulers, and it retained this importance during the succeeding Tang dynasty. The Longmen Caves are just outside the city, and they stretch for more than a kilometer along the west bank of the Yi River. There are well over a thousand caves here, and literally hundreds of thousands of depictions of the Buddha. Work started here in 492 CE and continued for some 500 years. One contemporary source says that in the early 6th century, when Britain was living through what's called the Dark Ages, some 800,000 workers were employed on the construction of these temples. Hu Guangda is a local scholar who has made a special study of these incredible caves. Why were the caves and statues built here? Buddhism already had a significant following in China at that time, and the royal Tuoga Wei family followed Buddhism. Initially, the emperor had grottoes built at Da Tong in Shanxi province, but when the capital was moved to Luoyang, he started construction of the Luoyang grottoes. The emperor decided to have the caves built here because the natural surface of the rock was so smooth and because the site was quite close to the capital. At the center of the cave complex is the main temple Feng Shuan, which would once have had a roof above it. The 14 meter high figure of the Buddha was completed in 675 CE. 
I'm completely knocked out by this place, Mr. and especially by the, the figure of the, of the main Buddha. It's absolutely beautiful. As Buddhism was widely practiced in China, it pushed forward the development of the art of carving Buddhist statues, which reached its peak at this time. The giant Buddha statue carved over there looks not only solemn and sacred, but also kind and loving. Many say that he has a mysterious smile, and to some, he is known as the Oriental Mona Lisa. But in my opinion, the art of this carving is even better than the art of painting in the Mona Lisa. When you look at the statue more closely, you can see his ever-changing smiles and expression. Alongside the main Buddha are two of his most devoted followers, his personal attendant Ananda and a monk of great wisdom, Kashpaya, together with a number of bodhisattvas, or beings that have attained a high degree of enlightenment. These and many other statues throughout the caves were commissioned by emperors, by members of the imperial family and generals, by wealthy individuals and religious groups, all of whom hoped to earn good fortune through their donations. So tell me about this cave that we've come to. This large cave is the earliest built among the Longmen grottoes, and it's called Gu Yang Cave. It was built in 493 after Emperor Xiao Wen moved his capital to Luoyang. This main Buddha statue is Buddha Shakyamuni. His face is elegant, his neck slim and fine, and his shoulders wide and open. The typical appearance of beauty, elegance and modesty. The red halo around the Buddha gives a sense, however faint, of the original impact of the statues, all of which would have been painted in bright colors. On the side walls are mid-sized carvings paid for by upper-class worshippers. And then, between these, there are smaller statues commissioned by working men and women. These are particularly fascinating because they illustrate the clothes and even the houses of a society from more than a millennium ago. Long Men is complete enough still to make a powerful impact on a visitor like me. But it's very apparent that many of the statues have been badly damaged, with their heads broken or removed entirely. Some of this damage is natural, but the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s also took its toll, with zealous Maoists determined to demonstrate their rejection of what they regarded as their country's superstitious past. Many of the culprits, however, came from rather uncomfortably closer to home. In the 20th century, Westerners found out about the Longmen grottoes at Luoyang, and in the 20s and 30s, lots of parts of the Buddhist statues and carvings were stolen and taken away. Now, they are in the museums of America, Britain, Canada, France and Japan where there are displays of the heads of the Buddha statues, so the better ones have all gone abroad. Before coming here to see the Longmen Caves, I got no idea of the scale, the beauty, the power of the place. Walking around, looking at the caves and the carvings, both the very large and the very small, I've come to appreciate just how intertwined the imported faith of Buddhism and Chinese society, from the very high, from the emperor, right down to the ordinary people, became. And Mr. Hu said that this place represents a pinnacle of Chinese and Buddhist art. And having walked around looking at all this with him, I appreciate what he means. Having been banned under Chairman Mao, Buddhism today is one of five religions sanctioned by the state. Although, like the statues in the Longmen Caves, many of the historic sites were damaged or even destroyed during the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, a number have since been immaculately restored. 
These include the remarkable Puning Temple at Chengdu, built a thousand years or so after the peak of activity at Longmen. Now we're going to skip over more or less a millennium of Chinese history and jump from the Tang Dynasty to the Qing. From the 9th century onwards, Buddhism was increasingly marginalized and suppressed in China, losing out to the native belief systems of Taoism and Confucianism. But then in the 18th century, it found official favor once more, and a key patron in the great Qing Emperor Qianlong. And high on this facade at the Puning Temple in Chengdu is an inscription in the Emperor's own hand. Chengdu was the summer retreat of the imperial court, and Puning is one of eight major temples that ring the city. For reasons that will become apparent, it's popularly known as the Big Buddha Temple. Before I arrived here, I think I was expecting more or less a museum, but what I found was a vibrant center of worship and a thriving community of Buddhist monks. I asked my first guide here, the director of the complex, when the temple was built. Puning Temple was built in 1755. At that time, the Qing government had succeeded in pacifying a rebellion in Tibet. To celebrate the victory, Emperor Chen Long decided to build the temple. The emperor wanted everyone to live in security, peace, harmony and prosperity. And Puning means exactly that in Chinese. The temple is dedicated to, to the harmony of the peoples. Is the architectural style here of the Chinese and Tibetan important to that? Emperor Chen Long wanted to unite all the ethnic minorities in China peacefully. The architectural style combines those of the Tibetan and the Han Chinese so it's the perfect integration of a Han Tibetan style temple, with the front built in the Chinese style and the back built in the Tibetan style. And indeed, that's exactly the case. The first main courtyard that you come to has all the elements of a conventional Chinese temple. But behind this, on top of a high platform, there's a complex of buildings that were modeled on the ancient Sanyi monastery in Tibet. Nara Song, one of the monks who lives and worships here, comes from Tibet, and it was he who introduced me to the Big Buddha. The, the huge statue in, 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 in the hall here, who, who is it? Who does it represent? The statue inside is the world's largest gold-painted wooden Buddha. It's called the Guanyin Buddha with 1,000 eyes and 1,000 hands. Traditionally, the Guanyin Buddha symbolizes supreme levels of wisdom. He was thought to have read so much in his lifetime, and that's why he has the many eyes and hands. For the statisticians among you, this statue of Guanyin is 27 meters high and some 50 meters around the waist. It weighs in at over 100 tons. That's amazing. Even in the gloom of the hall, it's an astonishing sculpture. No wonder it's in the Book of World Records. The Chinese call it Quan Yin, the one who hears the sound of the world, seeing, hearing, with all those arms stretched out in welcome and comfort. It's a terrific expression of that quality so revered in Buddhism, compassion. impact of Buddhism in the first millennium was felt right across East Asia, including in what today is Cambodia. Among the most extraordinary remains here are the temples and monasteries of Angkor, right in the heart of the country. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
I've just arrived in Cambodia at the city of Angkor Thom. It was the capital of the ancient Khmer Empire. Built in the 12th century, it was the world's largest pre-industrial city. And at its center is a state temple dedicated to the Buddha. This bridge leads to the Victory Gate of Angkor Thom, which means literally, Great City. It was the center of an empire that dominated much of Southeast Asia from the 9th to the 13th centuries. It's said that the faces on the gate towers may represent one of the Buddha's bodhisattvas, or they may be the face of the king who built all of this, Jayavarman VII. Remarkably, the Khmers left no written records apart from some stone inscriptions. But even a couple of hours wandering around the amazing ruins gives you a powerful sense of what must have been a truly astonishing metropolis. Right in the middle of the city, precisely aligned with the gates and with the points of the compass, is the official state temple called the Bayon. Climbing up through its levels with my guide, Professor Vati, we are confronted at every turn with the serene and enigmatic faces on each of the many towers. Wow. Because all these uh, pillars have, have faces on them. How many in, in all? Oh, actually, there are more than 271 faces because this temple has been decorated with 54 towers. That each of these 54 towers has the same four faces, which are opening to the four directions, okay. except the central tower. It has got more than four faces here. Once again, some scholars think the faces show the king himself, while others believe them to be the bodhisattva of compassion called Avalokitsvara. Or perhaps because Jayavarman VII identified so strongly with the Buddha and with the bodhisattva, they are meant to combine images of all three. This temple is dedicated to Buddha, is that right? And the principal idea of this temple was about the Buddhism, because the King Chayyavaman VII, he was the Buddhist king. It was not so much about the political situation, but about the religion. And he was bringing together uh, people of, of, of different religions, particularly of, of Buddhism, but also Hinduism. Was that, was that something he was concerned about? That was true, because before he came to the power, there was the struggling between the Hinduism and Buddhism. And they created the uprising inside the Khmer society. So the king got an idea as well to bring these two main religions together. And then he got to build this temple and he encouraged the people from Hinduism and Buddhism to join together. But the main concept is about the Buddhism. The temple's other great treasure is the series of bas reliefs that run around the lower levels with both mythological and historical scenes. So what are these bas reliefs of? What are, what are they showing? Oh, yes. If you look at this bas relief, all of the carvings are depicting about the real event which had taken place from the 12th century, especially we call the actual fighting between the Khmer and Jams in the year 1177 till the year 1181. So that's a battle between the Khmer Empire and the Chams who were in, in what is now Vietnam. Area. That's right, start so, off Vietnam. So what, so what are we looking at? Who, who are these guys? What are these characters? Oh, yes. If you look at all of the characters, you can, you can tell the different people. The army with the ropes across the chest, yeah. they were all Khmer armies okay. with long hair, big long nose and big oh, yeah, mouth, yeah, yeah, yes, that's and right. bare head. The long hair stands for the long life. And the ropes across the chest like this, these were not regular ropes. We call magical rope. Because this rope can help protect yourself from right. being wounded by the weapons, like the spear, like the sword, yeah. and they call the kind of the superstitions. The perhaps rather optimistic Khmers are fighting the Jams, whose invasion of Angkor Thom in 1181 was repulsed by King Jayavarman. With the Jams defeated, the king set about a great program of public building at Angkor Thom. 
including the construction from 1186 onwards of a royal temple and monastery, the Raja Vihara, in honor of his family. We've come away from, from the ancient town of Angkor Thom to another fantastic site. Where are we now? Uh, original name we call Raja Vihara, which means the royal monastery. The king who built this temple, his name was known as the King Jaya Woman Seven. He was the most prominent king of the Khmer Empire from the late 12th century. And this is a Buddhist temple? Uh, the real name is the Buddhist temple, but the activities it can be some part Hinduism and some part just Buddhism. Some 12 and a half thousand people lived and worshipped here in the heyday of the temple, which is known by its modern name of Ta Prom. But with the fall of the Khmer Empire in the 15th century, like many of the buildings of Angkor Thom and indeed of the nearby Angkor Wat, it was abandoned to the jungle. In contrast to so many of the other temples, however, when archaeologists began the process of restoration in the early 20th century, it was decided that Ta Prom, with its recently resident roots and towering trees, should be left, as they said, as a concession to the general taste for the picturesque. Today, its wonders and mysteries ensure that it is truly a magical place, and like nowhere else that I've been in the world. travels across Asia of the religion and philosophy of Buddhism also took it to Japan, where it continues to have a powerful influence. Buddhism came to Japan from China and Korea. In 552, the Korean king gave a bronze image of Buddha to the Japanese emperor, saying, this doctrine can create religious merit without measure and lead to an appreciation of the highest wisdom. It was initially taken up by the fashion-conscious court circles as a private faith with strong intellectual appeal. Today's train journey is taking me to one of Japan's greatest Buddhist temples, the Todaji, on the outskirts of the city of Nara. I'm in downtown Nara, a Japanese city near Kyoto. It's not so important now, but in the 8th century it was the imperial capital. As the easternmost destination on the Silk Road, and with a population of 200,000, it was one of the world's largest and most splendid cities. An explosion of temple building in the 700s transformed Nara into the Canterbury of Buddhism. Remarkably, some of those wooden buildings, amongst the oldest in the world, still survive today. There are wooden buildings here at Todaiji that date back 1,300 years. The most impressive is the truly gargantuan Great Buddha Hall, which was originally completed in 749. After numerous fires and attacks, it fell into disrepair, but a proper restoration was finally begun in the 17th century, and this Great Buddha Hall was dedicated in 1709. The Todaiji complex was founded by the Emperor Shomu. Built on an unprecedented scale, it wasn't just about spiritual commitment, but also a statement of political power. In 743, Shomu ordered the construction of a giant Buddha statue, ostensibly to protect the population from disasters and epidemics. In reality, it was clearly a symbol of his imperial might. He wanted to consolidate the importance of Nara as the capital and the center of Buddhism. At over 50 meters high and nearly 60 meters long, the Great Buddha Hall is the largest wooden structure in the world, although the original was apparently even bigger. I'm here to meet Mr. Suzuki, an expert on the Great Buddha. We have the huge statue here of the Buddha. What is the oldest part of it? The pedestal, which is in the shape of a lotus flower on which the great Buddha sits, is the oldest. That and the area around the knees date from around the 8th century. When the bronze Buddha was first cast, it's said that it nearly bankrupted Japan's economy. 
different parts of the current figure, which weighs some 500 tons, have been cast at different times over the centuries. So what is this hole in the column for? This hole is said to be the same size as the Buddha's nostril. We don't know why it's open like this, but people say such things as go through this hole and you won't get ill, or you will become cleverer. Many people come to Todaiji to pray, and children like to go through this hole. Can I have a try? Jacket oh, okay, okay. Let me go right. I'll go around the other side and see if I can get through. Thank you. I somehow think that this is not going to work. If I, I might get to the other, my next life. Hang on, I might get to the next life rather sooner than expected if I get stuck in there. So unfortunately, that's one blessing of the Buddha. I won't be able to cash in on life here. Mind you, 40 years ago, it would clearly have been a piece of cake for me. Contrasting with the bustling images of the modern city that we so strongly associate with Japan today, there's the vision of the tranquil Zen garden. And some of the very finest of these are at the temple of Kininji in the city of Kyoto. Just as Buddhism as a religion had come from China in the 6th century, so the particular school of Buddhism called Chan, or in Japanese Zen, also came from China. It arrived in Japan during the 12th century. It stressed the importance not of theoretical knowledge, but of meditation on the path towards enlightenment. Mr. Soseki Unrenin is one of the Buddhist monks at the Kenenji Temple. What is the importance of, of the garden to Zen? The Zen temple's garden describes the space in which we practice Zen, and also the ideal state of mind and heart that Zen strives for. When people come to the Zen gardens, we hope it calms their spirit, and they can appreciate the moment. To see something beautiful makes your heart feel fulfilled, and you feel grateful just to be alive. This is the most important thing in Zen Buddhism. Can you explain the elements of this garden, please? This is the circle, triangle, square garden, with the four elements necessary for humans to live. First, the earth represents the land, the world, and if the world didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to live. The earth is represented by the square as the foundation of everything. Next is water. If we didn't have water, we wouldn't be able to live. The circle represents water. Then comes fire. In Japanese, we write it as hai, which represents the sun. If the sun didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to live. If you look at the flame of a candle, it burns in a triangular shape. And so the sun is represented by a triangle. Finally, the wind. The significance of the wind is that the air moves to make the wind. And if you're wondering where the air is here, air is flowing all around. And so the teachings of the four elements are represented by this garden. The Zen garden represents all that is traditional and timeless in Zen Buddhism. But my next stop couldn't be more different. I'm on my way to Awaji Island, a journey by Shinkansen, the bullet train, to Osaka, and then local buses to Shingonshu Hompokuji, or Water Temple. The Water Temple is unlike any other temple I have seen. It's designed by the renowned Japanese architect Tadao Ando, who was born in Osaka. And from the outside, it is geometric and spare, with an austere use of the cast concrete that's often so much a feature of his buildings. When Ando designed this temple, he was able both to respond to tradition and create something absolutely modern. 
The journey from the Sanchi Stupa in India to here is one of great change, but also one of remarkable continuity. Wow, a beautiful lily pond. Like many lily ponds I've seen at temples, but where is the temple? It turns out the lily pond forms the roof of the temple. Tarao Ando is known for his use of water as an integral part of his designs. This temple replaces an earlier traditional temple and was commissioned by a local family. I'm here to talk to Shizuko Ushida, the priest's mother. What did you expect from the architect? Until we built this temple, we didn't even know how to spell Mr. Ando's name or what he looked like. We also didn't know how the temple was going to be designed, so we all wondered how it would turn out. When it was completed, it looked more like an art gallery or a museum rather than a temple. But in fact, everyone was very pleased. So how is the new temple different from the old one? The roofs of temples are usually majestic, but here the roof is a pond of water lilies. There have been several occasions when people would come here to visit, and they've said, there's no roof. And so then they'd go downstairs and ask, where's the temple? Then they'd come upstairs again and realize that there is no roof and go back down again. It's been 18 years since the temple was built, but even so, every year a few people still do this. It's very odd. Like many of Tadao Ando's buildings, there's a complex sense here of the outside and the inside being woven together, and you're not quite sure where the one ends and the other begins. the line of the of the pool above but it's um it's unusual normally you come straight into the the buddha hall or you can see the, the statues and lights but here it's as if one's in a maze being taken on and on somewhere oh, and here it is wow well, not what i'd expected the uh the altar seems to be the same, but the rest of the place is really different. I mean, the concrete roof above, it's a very unusual space. All this special vermilion red, the shoe color, quite unexpected. Um, it really feels like one's coming to the, uh, the inner sanctum. It's a very, very different atmosphere. But having said that, maybe that long walk around the outside of the, uh, of the central area is all about that, that Buddhist idea of, uh, of, of, of getting calm, getting yourself to a, a certain space to be able to be reflective. All of which makes me think back to the comparable calm of the prayer hall at the Amaravati Monastery in Berkhamsted, and to the extraordinarily varied places associated with Buddhism that I've seen on my travels across India, China, Cambodia, and now here in Japan. In each, the Buddha and his attendants offered a place for meditation and for stillness, and a way of moving beyond the bustle and busyness of the here and now, of reaching something more fundamental and profound than the everyday world in which we are all too often completely caught up. So I'm grateful that my journey to some of the most glorious sacred sites of Buddhism has given me a sense of another way of thinking and another way of being. 
Buddhism traveled from India to China through Korea to Japan. As it moved, it evolved and adapted with the people and cultures it met, nowhere more so perhaps than here in Japan, where it's had a close and usually happy relationship with Shinto, Japan's oldest religion. Right next door to this ultra-modern Buddhist temple is an old Shinto shrine. And it's to some of the far more spectacular shrines of Shinto that I'll travel in the next program, as well as to those of the related faith traditions in China of Confucianism and Taoism, which will take me, among other places, to the very gate of heaven. We've a ridiculously talented family next here on Sky Arts 2 HD, but one with their fair share of burdens and indeed myths to overcome. Judy and Liza are at the Palladium. Or if you nip over to Sky Arts 1 HD, the Strat Pack concert is just about to start.